morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Special welcome to any visitors that we have with us. We're glad to have you join us and invite you to join us again. We also welcome those who join us as for worship in their cars, uh, over the FM radio, uh, in the parking lot. We're glad to have you join us as well. Also a reminder that all of our worship services are video recorded and they are available on the church website for you to view. Uh, we do have a couple of announcements um, concerning um, our membership and uh, relatives. Um, Karen Eichenhorst's aunt, Lee Dell Krause, passed away on Tuesday, March 15th at the age of 92. Uh, she asked us to inform you that visitation will be Tuesday, March 22nd from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at Memorial Oaks Chapel in Brenham with graveside services Wednesday, March 23rd, 2 p.m. at St. John's United Church of Christ Cemetery in Burton. Also, many of you may have heard that Judy Aberhart um, was found dead at her home Saturday morning, uh, so arrangements are pending, uh, but we keep that family in our thoughts and prayers as well. Um, some instructions about communion. Um, please follow the direction of the ushers. Please be patient as we get back into the swing of things uh, with communion. Um, I will um, do the um, opening and the consecration of the elements uh, as we have been doing. Um, those of you who are in the cars um, and uh, those of you who are in the pews and will not be coming forward um, are asked to use the uh, communion kits as we've been doing. You will commune first. And after that, then the ushers will direct the rest of you that are going to come forward um, to receive communion uh, after that portion. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, 
I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, and bring your saving love to fruition in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Luther's small catechism, the Lord's Prayer, the fifth petition. The contemporary version, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And the traditional version, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What does this mean? We ask in this prayer that our Heavenly Father would not regard our sins or deny these petitions on their account. For we are worthy of nothing for which we ask, nor have we earned it. Instead, we ask that God would give us all things by grace, for we sin daily and indeed deserve only punishment. So, on the other hand, we too truly want to forgive heartily and to do good gladly to those who sin against us. The first lesson is taken from the 55th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the first verse. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, 
you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here ends the reading. Please read Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8, responsively as printed. O God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live. My hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul pleased to you. Your right hand holds me fast. The second lesson is from the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the first verse. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us, on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out, so that you may be able to endure it. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. At that time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. 
So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Some like to think Jesus was in a world to himself and was not really aware of what was going on in the world around him. Actually, Jesus and the people even in the days when there weren't television, were very aware of the news of the day. We have an example of this awareness in the gospel lesson this morning. Jesus mentions two events that occurred. Jesus and the people to whom he was speaking are very familiar with these events. The first one concerns some Jews from Galilee. The city of Jerusalem needed a new water supply, and the problem they faced was the same one many city governments face today. Where is the money going to come from? As governor of Galilee, it was Pontius Pilate's call, and for some reason he chose not to raise the money through taxation, but instead ordered it taken from the temple treasury. This, of course, made some God-fearing Jews very angry. That money given for holy purposes was going to be used for water pipes. So they created a real fuss and uproar and protested. Pilate sent in his riot squad to quell the protest, and in the quelling, some Jews were killed. The second incident Jesus was asked about concerned the collapse of one of the watchtowers guarding Jerusalem. When the Tower of Siloam fell with no warning, 18 people standing under it were killed. The people seem to want an answer about why these events happened. They're tempted to blame the victims, asking what they had done that was so particularly sinful that they deserved these tragedies. Jesus knows what they are thinking and asks, do you think that because the Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? Or are those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? Jesus' answer to these questions was an emphatic no. But then Jesus uses these events to make a point about repentance. But unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. Jesus warns of the coming judgment of God and of the need for people to prepare for that day. We are to prepare through repentance, Jesus says. A particular focus of what we are to do during this season of Lent. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sins, 
But it is a complete change of mind, change of attitude, change of behavior, both as individuals and as a community of faith. Repentance is us as individuals and as a congregation turning away from actions and attitudes that violate God's purposes and commandments in order to live more faithfully as individuals and as a congregation. I remember one day a man told me that he must be pretty good because God had allowed him to live into his 80s. I guess it was the spirit, I don't know what possessed me, but I told him, well, maybe God was graciously giving him more time in order to get his life in order. That is the point of today's gospel lesson. God is patient, allowing us time to repent. Our birthdays are to be thankful that God has granted us time to grow in faith and become more mature and more faithful people. Church anniversaries should recognize that God has given us more time to grow in faith and in ministry so that we can more faithfully live and serve in the ways God has called us. We should not mistake good fortune as evidence of God's special blessing. It is a gracious opportunity to grow more into what God would have us be. We have the opportunity to live and grow now. But Jesus warns us, there is a limit. Jesus makes this point of the patience of God in the parable of the barren fig tree. The owner planted a fig tree in his vineyard and came looking for fruit on it. In fact, he had been looking for three years and the tree had borne no fruit. The owner was now frustrated and had had enough. He says, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? As a farmer, I have to say I really can't blame him. As one of my soils professors from college commented, whatever you do, you must be able to make a profit in living. This was not happening in the parable. And so the owner decided it was time to try a new tree or a new variety or a new crop, cutting his losses sooner rather than later. But then in the parable, the gardener, the one who daily tends the tree and cares for it, intervenes. He asked the owner to let him care for the barren tree one more year. To dig around it, to loosen the soil, and put manure on it to feed it with nutrients. When I read that, I thought of a story about Bess Truman though the story is almost certainly apocryphal. I looked and it has many variations in many places it is supposed to have occurred, but it has the same punchline. The one version that I read and chose to use has Harry Truman as president making a speech at the Washington Garden Club. He gave credit for his beautiful flowers to the good manure he used to fertilize them. The prim and proper ladies didn't think much of the president's repeated use of the word manure in his speech. One of them said something to the first lady, Bess Truman. She asked Bess if she could make him stop using the word manure. It was a vulgar word in their opinion, and he was, after all, the president of the United States. Bess replied, heavens, no, it took me 25 years to get him to say manure. (laughs) 
Manure is important for producing fruits. It brings nutrients when incorporated into soil. It allows looser structure of soil so that the soil holds more moisture and nutrients. But enough about soil morphology. What is important is that the owner is patient enough to let the plant live for one more year, seeing if the gardener will be able to help it produce fruit. Of course, the owner in the parable represents God. The gardener is Jesus and his disciples. The clear message is that God's people are expected by God to produce fruit of the kingdom. And if they do not, destruction awaits them. It's notable that Jesus tells this parable immediately after warning his listeners of their need to repent. The owner of the vineyard has been looking for fruit on the fig tree for three years. Jesus, who is on his way to Jerusalem and to his death, has been ministering and calling people to the kingdom of God for three years. The owner of the vineyard was disappointed of no fruit being produced. Jesus continues to see opposition to and rejection of God's work in his ministry. The owner of the vineyard is patient. And his patience is grace, allowing the unproductive tree another year to produce fruit. Jesus follows obediently, even unto death on a cross, extending grace and allowing people more time to repent and live more faithfully as God's people by producing fruit of God's kingdom. Jesus' resurrection from death promises hope through God's grace for all. But God's patience dare not be taken for granted. One day there will be no more time and chance to repent. As the gardener in the parable said, if it bears fruit, next year well and good but if not you can cut it down the message of the barren fig tree is a message for us both in its promise and challenge as God's people we are called individually and as a congregation to bear the fruit of God's kingdom like the owner of the parable, God is looking at us to see if we are bearing fruit as he demands. God desires that when others look at us as individuals and as a congregation, that they clearly see his fruit. And what is this fruit? St. Paul in Galatians lists the fruit of God the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. One question is, when others look at us as individuals and as a congregation, do they see these fruits present and active in us? Another question is, when others think of these fruits of God, the Holy Spirit, would they say, yes, that perfectly describes the people of St. Paul Rayburg. If not, then we have some repenting and growing to do. Indeed, each new day is a, God, is a day of God's patience that is grace, allowing us time to repent and grow 
so that we bear God's fruit faithfully. And this is something we need to be about quickly and now. For the time to do so may come to an end for us soon and unexpectedly. Another message from today's text is that God does not abandon us. Like the gardener continued to break up hard soil around the barren fig tree and continued to nourish it with manure, hoping that it would finally bear fruit, so God continues to tend to us. He continues to send his word to break hard heads and hard hearts and to encourage growth. And that word to nourish and feed us hoping to see fruits of the kingdom produced in and through us. But we must receive and respond to God's care. Back before the U.S. entered World War II, Winston Churchill sent a letter to President Roosevelt saying, send us the tools and we will do the job. That sounds much like the pleas from the Ukrainian president now in our day. Question is, are you like Winston Churchill, give us the tools and we'll do the job? Or like James Bailey, who was a superintendent of the Fort Worth, Texas public schools. Meeting one day with a citywide parent teachers association, Bailey sought to communicate openness and accessibility. He told the audience he would be pleased to speak with them any hour of the day or night. In fact, he said, here's the telephone number and proceeded to recite it. Then there was a sudden outcry from the assistant superintendent, Joe Ross. Hey, Ross shouted, that's my number you're giving out. <laughs> now, Bailey was having some fun with his assistant superintendent. But I'm afraid it's often true that when it comes to God calling to get something done, all too many people ask or hope that folks will call the number of some helpline from a religious group on TV, or at least the pastor. We hope they call anyone but us. And yet, we're all in this together. I'm afraid too often we hope fruit is born just as long as someone else does the work. But each of us must bear fruit of God's kingdom. And we as a congregation must bear fruit of God's kingdom. We have to do the work together. We cannot expect someone else to do our work for us. And here is another bit of grace for us. We do not do our work alone or rely solely on ourselves and our own strength. Our risen Lord Jesus, who promised to be with us always, is present with his spirit and gifts us with his life. It is this risen Lord who nourishes us with his very body and blood in the holy meal today. It is this risen Lord who patiently calls us to return to God in repentance and to know his forgiveness of grace and grace. It is this risen Lord who encourages us to use our days to grow in him and produce faithful fruits of God's kingdom. 
And so we thank God for being patient with us, giving us time to repent, to grow, and to bear fruit. God's patience is grace for us. Lord God, help us to use your gift of days so that we might live with Jesus as Lord of our lives, being obedient to him, following and serving him, so that we might bear faithful fruit for you. Amen. stand. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the saints, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church around the world in all its forms, for pastors, deacons, bishops, chaplains, and mission developers, for church councils, committee chairs, and all lay ministry leaders, for congregations that contemplate difficult decisions about the future of their ministry. Merciful God. For the health of this planet and the well-being of its creatures, for lands impacted by droughts and at risk of wildfires, for fig trees and vineyards that produce fruit for our nourishment and delight, and for animal habitats. Merciful God, for those called into positions of civic responsibility, for judges, attorneys, and court administrators tasked with uncovering truth and delivering justice. For activists and community leaders who cast a vision of a more compassionate and equitable society. Merciful God. 
For those who call upon you for mercy, for all who live in poverty and experience hunger, for any who feel tested beyond their strength, for those who are hospitalized or near death, for those who mourn the passing of loved ones, especially the families of Waldo Neenstead, Kathy Klebb Newman, Lee Dale Krause, and Judy Eberhardt. And for all in need of healing, Joanne Hundemer, Annie Malky, Ray Neenstead, Tom Brinkmeyer, Mark Hundemer, Travis Fisher, Barely Goldberg, Betty Holt, Edna Weiss, Diane Baneman, Lutz Milhorn, Wayne Dean, Martha Winston, and others we name aloud. Jean. Merciful God, for the advocacy efforts of this congregation, for those whose faith leads them to speak difficult truths and engage in difficult conversations with policymakers, for those who promote mercy over vengeance or retaliation, merciful God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for our sister churches of Eastern Europe, and for all people experiencing war or unrest. Kindle in the hearts of all your children the love of peace, and guide with your wisdom the leaders of the nations, so that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of your love. Merciful God, for those whose earthly journeys have ended, we give thanks. With all the saints, we praise you for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Merciful God, Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. We share that peace with one another. and shall you tarry that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you O Lord Holy Father through Christ our Lord you bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are going to take communion in the cars or in the pews, please prepare your communion elements.
blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his Holy Supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. you who are taking communion in the cars or in the pews, take the bread and eat it. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take the cup and drink it. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.